It was a routine flyover for the Coast Guard. Miles and miles of deep blue ocean. Suddenly, guardsmen noticed a makeshift flag on a deserted island between Key West and Cuba. They lowered from 500 feet to see what was going on there. Two men and a woman were waving hands in distress. It was apparent they needed immediate help. The crew couldn't land at once because of the bad weather, but they dropped some food, water, and a radio to discover why they were there. They learned the castaways had been there in the Bahamas for a whopping 33 days already. Their boat hit a storm and capsized, and all they could do was swim to the nearest island. They also informed the crew the woman needed help as soon as possible. The next day, the rescue crew arrived in a helicopter and took the castaways to a hospital in Key West. This helped them avoid any serious consequences for their health. Everyone who took part in the rescue operation was surprised at how well the rescuees handled the situation and how coherent their speech was. So, five weeks on an island with no food or drinkable water sources. How did they survive, you might ask? Well. They were smart enough to have used coconuts to stay hydrated and conscious for food. And they did a great job building the flag for prospective rescuers to see. That's one of the secrets of surviving if you ever find yourself in a similar situation. Burn damp or wet wood to produce some smoke. Arrange flares in a triangle. Pile large rocks spelling out SOS or HELP. These are all internationally recognized distress signals. If you're changing your location for some reason, leave an arrow made out of rocks, showing which direction you went. To ensure the rescuers can not only see you, but hear you, make a whistle out of an acorn. Hold an acorn cap with both hands between your thumb and index finger. Make a triangle with your thumbs near the top of the acorn. Hold it close to your mouth and let some air through that triangle in the cap. You've got to practice a bit to make a loud sound. Ha, ouch, that was too loud. If you get lost, remember the rule of three to stay calm and do the right things in the correct order. You can survive three minutes without air, three hours in extreme temperature, three days without water, and three weeks without food. So start with building a shelter, then get water, and only then take care of the food. If you're in better luck than the Bahamas castaways and have some matches with you, make them waterproof. Cover them with a thin layer of transparent nail polish and let them dry well. To always have something to light them with, glue a piece of sandpaper to a plastic box lid and put matches inside. Packing for a hike? Cotton clothing won't keep you safe and warm out in the wild. It takes forever to dry from sweat or rain and wet clothes lose heat 25 times faster than dry clothes. If you don't want to freeze, go for polyester, nylon, or wool. Pack some microfiber towels with you that dry in one hour. What is that buzzing? Before you run away in horror, remember that the presence of bees is a good sign. They usually don't go further than four to five miles away from a water source. But it looks pretty dirty, huh? You can use your t-shirt or a bandana as a water filter. Put one end of it in a container filled with muddy water, standing above an empty container for clean water. The other end goes in there, and the water pours in, cleaning itself on the way. Make sure to boil the filtered water before you drink it. Ran out of water? The trees have got you covered. They always lose some water to the atmosphere, and it's all yours to trap. Find a thick green tree with a lot of branches. Around sunrise, tie a plastic bag over the branch with the most leaves to cover them completely. Add a small rock to the bag to weigh it down a bit. During the day, the water from the leaves will condense right into your bag. The final product will be so pure, you won't even need to filter it. If you see a halo around the sun, it's a clear sign low pressure is approaching and it will surely bring some rain or snow in the next 24 to 36 hours. If the halo is broken, you can even predict where the storm is coming from, right from the damaged side. Sounds like a storm is coming. You can make yourself a waterproof trash bag mini shelter to come out of it dry and warm. 
Just make a hole for your face and put it on. Use two bags to keep your feet dry too. If you hear thunder, count the seconds between it and the lightning flash. If it's less than 30 seconds, you have to hide somewhere because the storm is too close. If you can't do that, stay away from tall lone trees. If you're in a group, spread out to minimize the risks of everyone getting shocked. You can also build an A-frame shelter out of a trash bag. Find some sticks for the central rib. Split the bag into a blanket and cover the rib with it. Use four rocks to keep the corners down. Trash bag or no trash bag, never build your shelter on damp ground or on the top of hills. The wind might get extra strong at night and there will be no trees to protect your shelter from flying away. Now that you've got yourself some shelter, make a good bed inside. Use dry leaves or grass. Get them under your clothes or blankets for an extra layer of insulation. This tip works both for winter and summertime. You always risk losing more body heat than you can produce. Don't have a rope on you? You can make one yourself out of plants. Find some long grasses, or even better, dry ones, and weave them together in a braid or just a cord. You can also use bark from trees or branches you find on the ground. Before you venture into the wild, especially the wild with plenty of bushes and thickets, make sure your shoelaces won't get caught on the branches. Tape the loose ends with duct tape to your upper ankle, and voila, you won't fall, at least because of tangled laces. As you prepare for your adventure, master at least one basic knot. Trust me, it can be life-saving. The bowline will help you if you need to attach something to a rope via a loop. The tighter you pull, the tighter the knot gets. Lay the rope across your hand and form a small loop in it. Pull the free end up and take it through the eye from the underside. Sounds too complicated? Remember it like this. The rabbit comes out of the hole, around the tree, then back down the hole. So yes, you gotta wrap the line around the standing line and take it back down through the loop. Now tighten it and your knot is ready. If you have some food on you that you'd like to keep edible for longer, put it into a plastic bag or thin fabric and seal it up. You can use a rubber band, a hair tie, or a bungee cord. Dig a hole in the loose soil deep enough to host your food. Cover it with a hand towel so hungry animals don't find it before you. Refill the hole with soil and add some moss, straw, or leaves to smooth it down. If there's some ice or snow available, use it for a super cooling effect. Be sure to mark your cache somehow so you can find it later. Now you have two to three days before the perishables go bad. Icy water squeezes your chest so you can't take a deep breath. You hear people yelling around. It's late at night and the endless sea blends with the black starry sky. You're scared and cold. The ship you were just aboard is going down into the depths of the ocean. People who have been in a shipwreck often remain afraid of water for the rest of their lives. But the woman whose story you'll hear survived not one and not even two, but three ship disasters and continued to work on cruise liners as a stewardess. Meet Violet Jessup, Miss Unsinkable. Her childhood can be described in one word, short. She had to grow up quickly to take care of her siblings. Violet was the oldest of nine children. Life became even more difficult when she became very ill. The doctors were sure she wouldn't survive, but she did. At a young age, she moved to England with her mother, took care of her sisters, and attended a convent school. Her mother worked as a stewardess at sea, and when she fell sick, young Violet followed in her footsteps. But because of her youth and beauty, no one wanted to hire her. They thought she would distract passengers and crew. Violet didn't give up, though, and came to one of the interviews in her worst clothes and with unkempt hair. She wanted to show she was ready for hard work on the ship, and she had it. The girl was hired. The first two years passed quietly. But then, a series of incredible fortunes began, or misfortunes, depending on how you looked at it. In 1910, Violet got a job on the most luxurious liner of the time, the Royal Mail Ship Olympic. The ship sailed across the Atlantic, 
from England to America. The engineers didn't focus on the speed of the vessel, but on its comfort. Violet worked on the ship and was paid just two pounds a month, the same as 200 pounds today. Hard work on the ship's deck from morning to night didn't frighten Violet. She loved the job. She liked to talk to people and enjoyed the beautiful views of the Atlantic. So, on September 20th, 1911, Violet worked on the deck as usual. The sea was calm and the weather was excellent. Nothing boded ill. The ship sailed through the Solent Strait, which separates the Isle of Wight from the British mainland. At this moment, the British military cruiser Hawk appeared ahead. It should have passed by the Olympic, but something went wrong. The ships went straight at each other. The Olympic's captain tried to maneuver to avoid a collision, but failed. The Hawk's bow was designed specifically to ram other ships. At that time, it rammed the Olympic. Boom. The liner shuddered, and the people screamed in fear and panic. The ship had a huge hole in the starboard. Violet fell from the force of the blow. It seemed one of the biggest liners of its time was going to sink. But luckily, that wasn't the case. Both ships stayed afloat, and nobody got hurt. This time, fortune was on Violet's side. The accident on the ship didn't frighten the young woman. She didn't give it a second thought and continued to work as a stewardess. In April 1912, she took a job on the best unsinkable ship of the time, where she was supposed to serve VIPs. Initially, she didn't want to work on this ship, but her friends persuaded her. And thus, she boarded the Titanic on April 10, 1912, and left the port of Southampton for better or worse. The first days of work were peaceful, but on the fourth day of the voyage, one of the most notorious disasters in the world struck. Violet was resting in her cabin. She was almost asleep when she felt the jolt. At that moment, she was called to the upper deck. When the Titanic hit the iceberg, almost no one panicked. No one believed that the unsinkable ship could actually sink. At the time when the ship's hold was being filled with water, everybody was calm on the upper decks. Violet, along with other stewards, was present during the evacuation to the lifeboats. Women and children were evacuated first. Then, one of the ship's officers ordered Violet to get into a boat to show the other women it was perfectly safe. When she did, others followed, and someone suddenly thrust a swaddled baby into her hands. Without a second thought, Violet hugged the child to her chest to keep it warm, while the Titanic was sinking. She didn't let go of the baby until her lifeboat was picked up by the Carpathia, a ship that came to the rescue. Already on board the ship, a woman ran up to her. She didn't say a word and snatched the child from Violet's hands. Violet thought the woman was the baby's mother, so she didn't try to get it back. She was too freezing and numb to think how strange it was that this woman hadn't said thank you to her baby's savior. Many years later, Violet would be reminded of this child under unusual circumstances. After successfully surviving one of the most terrible shipwrecks in history, Violet continued to work at sea against all odds. In 1916, she took a job as a nurse on the hospital ship Britannic, a sister to both the Olympic and the Titanic, which sailed in the Aegean Sea. On November 21st, the ship took a route that it had already sailed several times. But on that particular day, it was out of luck. The Britannic hit an underwater mine. Violet managed to survive the third shipwreck in her life. This rescue wasn't as easy as the previous two, though. After the explosion, the huge Britannic began to sink quickly. It took less than an hour for the ship to go down completely. Violet didn't have time to board a lifeboat, so she jumped overboard into the cold water. There, she swam to the closest lifeboat and got on. But the rescue turned into a new danger. The ship's propellers were still working. They were spinning in the water and pulling the boat toward them. Violet jumped off the boat just in time to escape the propellers. But her ordeal 
was far from over. Already in the water, she was pulled under the ship's keel and hit her head. The only thing that saved her from losing consciousness and probably her life was her thick hair. In the end, Violet got away from the engine and was picked up by another boat. For the next few years, Violet was plagued by headaches. When she finally went to the doctor, he told her she was incredibly lucky. As a result of the incident on the Britannic, she had a fracture in her skull. Three disasters that Violet managed to survive didn't stop her. She continued to work on cruise liners until 1950. She cruised the world twice on the luxury liner Belgianland. Fortunately, the string of mishaps ended and Violet was never shipwrecked again. In 1950, she moved to Great Ashfield in Suffolk County. She'd worked at sea for almost 42 years. Content with her career, she settled in a large cottage built in the 16th century. But a year into her retirement, she received a strange phone call. It was late at night. Violet was asleep when the phone rang. She picked up the phone. There was a woman's voice on the other end. The lady didn't introduce herself and asked right away, Excuse me, was it you who saved a baby on the Titanic? Violet answered, yes. It was me, the strange woman said. She laughed and hung up. Violet told her friend about this strange call. He assumed that some kids were playing a joke on her. But Violet had never told anyone about the baby before that call. According to the old records, the only child who was on the boat with Violet was a boy. But those same records also said the boy had been saved by another passenger. It's still unknown who the baby that Violet rescued was. And so, for surviving three different wrecks on three different ships, she was aptly dubbed Miss Unsinkable. Now, you know your odds of getting struck by lightning are 530,000 to one. You already knew that, right? The chances that you will win the lottery at least once in your life are 500,000 to one. The possibility of winning the lottery twice is almost zero. Now, this incredible story may seem like fiction since its events seem so unreal. It's unlikely that any director would want to make a film about this because the audience wouldn't believe it. You can easily find evidence on the internet if you don't believe it either. So, here we are in Australia in 1998. Meet Bill Morgan. He lives on the outskirts of the country in a trailer park. Bill works as a truck driver, so he gets behind the wheel of his car and goes off to work. During the ride, he feels unwell. Bill stops the car and loses consciousness. Somebody notices him and calls an ambulance. They take him to the hospital. Doctors immediately determine that Bill has had a heart attack. They give him the necessary treatment with medications. But Bill's condition worsens because of an allergic reaction. His heart stops. From a medical point of view, if it doesn't beat for 7 minutes, it means that a human has passed away. Bill's heart hasn't been working for about 14 minutes. It seems there's no chance. But doctors continue to fight for his life. And then a miracle happens. Bill comes to life. The heart is beating again, but the patient's brain doesn't show signs of life. Bill is in a deep coma. A few days have passed. Doctors understand that Bill has a risk of remaining in a vegetative state for the rest of his life. Even if he regains consciousness, his brain will still be damaged. Twelve days have passed. The doctors offer Bill's family to disconnect him from the life support machine, but they refuse to do it. At this challenging moment, the family meets a specialist from another hospital. He tells them about some experimental treatments that might help. They have no guarantees that Bill will survive, but at least they can try. The family agrees and transports Bill to another hospital. After being treated with the new medication, Bill spends another 15 days in a coma. Then, one day, he comes to his senses and goes on the mend. What happened to him is what doctors call a medical miracle. But real wonders are waiting for him ahead. 
he returned to his trailer park on Melbourne's outskirts and continued living there with his girlfriend Linda. Twelve months had passed. Bill works as a driver again. He proposed to his girlfriend and is preparing for the wedding. He gets into the truck and goes to the city on business. On the way, he stops by a store and buys a lottery ticket. He scrapes off the protective layer and realizes he's just won a Toyota Corolla, which costs about 30000 Australian dollars. Wow! Bill can't believe his eyes. Considering Bill had health problems after a heart attack and couldn't work much, the new car was a great gift. A few days later, a local TV channel contacts him. Producers want to make a report about Bill. They were amazed not because Bill got a lucky lottery ticket, but because he came out of a coma before that. And so, reporters come to him, take a short interview, and then go with him to the city in the new car. The director wants Bill to buy a lottery ticket and erase it on camera so that later, during the editing of these shots, the announcer tells Bill's story. So Bill buys the ticket, goes to the table, wipes the protective layer with a coin. His eyes widen. He takes the ticket and reads it several times. I just won $250,000, he says, and doesn't believe it. The cameraman thinks Bill is joking, but he looks pretty serious. This is not a joke, he says. He shows the ticket. Yes, it's true. Bill won the lottery for the second time and did it in front of the cameras. You can easily find the video on the internet and see his reaction to the event. Bill calls his girlfriend and tells her the good news. With this money, he finally moves out of the trailer and buys a real house. Life is getting better. Bill has his real estate, a car, and a beautiful wife. He regularly buys lottery tickets, but wins nothing. At least, that's what he says. By the way, the luckiest person on the planet is Frano Selak from Croatia. One day, he was traveling by train. Something went wrong, and the train derailed. Several of the cars fell into the river. Frano miraculously survived. He was able to swim to shore and call for help. A year after these events, Frano was flying on a plane. Right in the sky, an emergency exit door ripped off the plane. Frano flew out with other passengers and was the only survivor. People found him lying in a haystack. They took him to the hospital. Frano has no serious injuries and left the hospital. A few years later, in 1966, the man had an accident on a bus trip. The vehicle left the road and fell into the river. Frano remained alive and unharmed. His adventures didn't end there. In 1970, he was driving his car on the motorway when his gas tank caught fire. Frano left the vehicle in time. It exploded in front of his eyes. Frano realized that some magic had been happening with his life. He lived quietly for the next three years. All this time, he felt that something else bad was about to happen soon. And he was right. In 1973, a fuel pump spilled gasoline on his car and body at a gas station and caught fire. Frano survived again and got almost no damage. But there were two more severe disasters ahead of him. The first happened in 1995. This time, he wasn't driving the car or sitting inside the plane. He was just walking. He crossed the road and saw a bus moving towards him. It was too late, and the bus hit him. Fortunately, Frano survived. He wasn't surprised anymore and just wanted these accidents to stop. The last thing happened while driving his car on a mountain road. Suddenly, a big truck appeared in the opposite lane. It was moving towards him at great speed. Frano managed to jump out of the vehicle and stay alive. His car exploded, and he got minor scratches and bruises. It's hard to believe in such luck, or maybe it was bad luck, considering that Frano had been in disaster so often. In any case, many people decided to verify the authenticity of these stories. It turned out that nobody could confirm plane and train crashes. There were no reports of these incidents. Perhaps Frano invented all this or added some fantastic details to make his story more unbelievable. We'll never know the truth. But one thing about this man you can know for sure. After all these trials, Frano got really lucky. He won almost a half a million dollars in the lottery. He bought a luxury house but then sold it. After all the disasters that he has experienced, he realized that money wasn't the main thing. He married five times in his life. And so, after selling the house, 
he returned to a modest home to spend the rest of his life with his beloved fifth wife. All the remaining money, Freno spent on a complicated hip operation and charity. Wow, imagine if Frano had been an Uber driver. Would you get in the car with him?